Roy, if I can come to you, and, and you know, we were talking earlier about you, you sometimes can't disintermediate all these different pieces. You know, they, are, they all seem to come back together again, and, and there's other technical building blocks that we, we should be looking at. We should be looking at MEC as well, shouldn't we? Multi-access edge, edge computing. I mean, how, how does this fit into the picture? Well, you know, it's, and it's interesting, as Prabesh said, right, if, I don't know which metaphor you'd like to pick, but if you looked at this as it's, it's really a huge dinner you're sitting down to, right? And you have to do it one bite at a time. Um, because if you try to take it all in, if you try to do a massive transformation without having any previous experience with NFV technology, for example, you're going to find yourself both organizationally and technically challenged, trying to figure out how do I juggle this? Do I bring my IT groups together? Do I bring my operations teams together? And, and MEC is one piece of that, right? Um, as we discussed, you know, we're still working through the over-the-air access uh, evolutions. And when I talk about getting the right compute, you know, the right storage, the software stacks where it needs to be, MEC is one method to do that, right? I can start pushing more and more stuff to the edge. I can take the load off the network. Um, and there's use cases today that that just makes sense for. And, and I think where we've seen the most success, right, is where is where organizations have decided either be because they have a new service, you know, they have a new service they're trying to put together, or frankly, they have a piece of their network that's, that's, uh, that they're trying to move out and they need to replace. Well, instead of replacing it with, yet again, something else that's a little archaic, right, they can use this opportunity to do that. So it's a little bit try before you buy, if you will, but, but you have to go, you have to go now. If you wait, and we were joking in the room, right, I said, if you wait for someone to shoot the starting, starting gun, um, everyone else is going to be well down the track and you're still going to be sitting there. But it's also, as Rupesh said, because it's a huge risk-killing yeah. project. It's right. a huge Absolutely. transformation, not to say disruption. Yes. And so... It's also an incentive to start early yeah. because we have also this ramp up and yeah. this learning curve yeah. that is so. So, so you, have to pick, to you have to pick some smart yeah. spots to go in. Mm -hmm. right. and, and Caroline, don't want to miss uh, leave MEC without talking about what Intel's doing there because that's, this is quite fundamental to your strategy as well. Yeah, I mean we started MEC three four years ago with uh, a group of Nokia, Huawei, DoCoMo, Vodafone. And when we first started, everybody sitting around go, well, what's a killer app, what's a killer app? In reality, the lesson learned is you make a really flexible and open platform with the right amount of API that's standardized. Once you put it out there, it turns out every vertical have their own killer app. Hmm. which is that today they're not being well connected or not cost effectively connected. Once we put it out there, in one of the trial markets we put it, in three months we put it out there, they put 26 applications on it. We never even imagined. We, didn't, we could not sit around and imagine. We spent literally two years thinking about all this killer app. But verticals have their own killer app. The, goal for us to do is provide a platform that allows innovation right. Right. and the kill lab will come. The kill lab is not universal over, in fact, it's probably different <clears> by <throat> geo. Today, I just had the first round of meetings with different and operators interested in Mac. The question came up and said, look, find the enterprise, mm -hmm. the kill app is in the enterprise. Right, right, absolutely. I, I voluntarily agree with Caroline here because, you know, we, we always keep thinking about, you know, what is that monetization opportunity mm -hmm. with the killer app? And what we miss is the, the platform is the killer app, right? Yeah. Because the enterprise are the ones driving the innovation. Yeah. You know, I go and meet with lots of our global customers and they say, what can we do, Rupesh? Like, what should I do? So with me, it's like a consulting therapeutic sessions, but they know the answers. Mm -hmm. They know yeah. where their business needs to go. Right. Mm. But, well, it goes back to the, the, the risk and reward as well, right? If, if you approach it from that dimension, this is clearly going to evolve over time, right? There, there's no set standards, right? We're all yeah. a consortium trying to figure this out. But if you build it based upon software foundations and software frameworks, that's evolvable as well. And you're not locked into the same paradigm right. as before. So you can actually take those risks, quote unquote, because you've actually deferred them a little bit in the beginning. And Javier, when we yeah. look at the verticals, of course, um, we have the whole concept of network slicing, which feeds back into a, a, a telco's transformation um, yep. strategy. Yeah, uh, but actually, I, I tend to agree with, with this. I mean, you know, if we want to make this transformation driven by use cases, the problem is that it's too risky. I mean, is there any use case that you would bet to 
uh, to drive your whole transformation, all the deployments? Probably not. But probably the combination of many, which might work or might not work, is, is, the, is the out of there is where you get the sources of revenue. The problem is that you need to change the way that you build the services. Because it's too expensive, you need to do a special project for every single service, you'd better do well. And, and all of them should pay back. So we are now in the, in the situation, coming back to the slicing, where we have the opportunity to create an, a new services and try with not that much in, uh, risk that we did in the past. Because the platform is already there, as you mentioned. And the thing is that we can build on top of that platform, see how it goes, and how the demand goes. No, not paying for telesurgery from day one. So, but per perhaps that is a good idea. We don't know. But if we need to create a rollout specific for that, it will never work out. So now the slicing gives us the opportunity to explore the verticals and explore them in a manner that does not require creating a new project for them or are not a, a heavyweight project for them. So that's awesome. And that is the, 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 the new lever that we, that we have here together with the cloud native uh, uh, experience that bring, that bring the, the 5G. So. Can I look now at IoT? Because when we started talking about 5G not so long ago, we had a nice little diagram. It was a triangular diagram. We had enhanced mobile broadband. We had low latency, high reliability. We had massive IoT. And yet, it seems that the IoT side of the picture has just taken a bit of a back seat, maybe because we're still at the point of developing LTE-based IoT solutions, so there's a lot of investment and time and effort gone in, into there. Um, are we seeing a bit of a redefinition of where IoT fits with, with, with 5G at the moment? Who would like to tackle that one? Caroline. So um, we also have MB IoT. In fact, uh, one of several customers will be going into uh, MB IoT trial in China, but we're not talking the same thing. MB IoT is really about a narrow, low data rate kind of yep. thing. If you come to the Intel booth, we're showing a connected car with BMW and Ericsson. That is not MB IoT. That is a mission critical IoT with a massive amount of data that needs to be downloaded. It could be road hazard, it could be road closure, right? It could be a high def map that needs to be downloaded in real time. So that is really about what we talk about with a 5G type of IoT. What about eHealth? If I'm going to do a remote surgery, I sure do not want latency later. Right. <laughs> I want mission okay. critical <laughs> IoT yes. running. I won't say it's going out of the light on the opposite. It's a big focus, I suspect, yeah. to data, both on, of the industry, because we're thinking about uh, a lot of uh, applications. The, uh, else, the smart cities uh, uh, are a big subject of focus, but also the robotics for the industry 4.0. So we have many fields of application, more or less critical, yeah, of course, but that has, are also an opportunity for us to regain, when I say us, it's still close, to regain some value and, uh, from our connectivity, from our network, because of this very reason of critical IoT. And that's why also um, it could be a key differentiator and a key happening in the, in the industry. So what I want to emphasize here is that collectively we have also a big stake to make it standardized, even if it's a classical standardization, of de facto standardization as the open source may, may drive today. But uh, it's with this uh, ultra re reliable and low latency uh, uh, IoT, uh, which needs to be standardized because it's one of the uh, key enablers, I suspect, or key, key applications yeah. that could make it happen. And, uh, we focus really on that and, and foresee a lot of applications and business opportunity within Orange. Uh, so yeah, right. I, mean, I mean, just to pile on to what she said, right? I mean, I see IoT actually being one of the key drivers behind 5G. And it's also one of the key drivers that's showing that the original concept of 5G isn't all that it needed to be, right? It's what's driven some of the evolution in the definition. And as I say, you start to see more and more of the workloads having to be dealt with at the edge, regardless if we get to, you know, sub-millisecond end, end timings and gigabit bandwidths, that's still not going to be enough, you know, if you have robotic right. surgery or whatever it might yeah. be, right? 
Um, so, so it does drive you to that new space. And I think that's really the use case that a lot of us are landing on. And, and, and as Caroline said, you know, you can come, you know, you go to my World Congress, you'll see all sorts of applications on it. We've got multiple smart city applications going on. We have industrial ones as well. And, and it's less about the radio technology and the, what's happening across the, the expanse of the network, but what's happening localized, and then what things do you move into the network, right? And what things do you keep back? Right. Can we move along to consider the timelines of introduction of all these technologies and, and, and 5G? Um, Rupesh, perhaps we can, sure. we can start with AT&T. You know, yeah. you were in the news recently about accelerating one aspect of 5G introduction, yeah. or trying to. Yeah. Um, wh wh what do we see as, the, as the, the timelines in implementation, and where are the various crunch points that we're going to come across? Right, right. So, you know, we've, we've kind of like publicly talked about our acceleration and evolution to 5G, right? We've had partnerships with Intel, with Ericsson, with others to kind of start to move in this direction rapidly. We've done trials in Austin and Indianapolis, et cetera. And you know, it's, it's interesting because you asked the IoT question, and if you think about IoT is that phenomenon where the innovation never stops, right? There's always a new idea. There's always something new the next day, right? So what that is doing is putting tremendous amount of sort of, you know, pressure onto the networking aspect mm -hmm. to say, how fast can it be? Can you deliver an agile experience? Can you deliver the low latency that we talked about, right? So with that comes, investments, right? So you need a lot of capital to do this. Comes with, you know, densification because you're moving one gigabit or higher speeds, right? And the mission criticality of the applications is riding on that infrastructure. So, you know, don't quote me, but I think, you know, it's a, you know, if, if we had it all right, I'm thinking around sort of two to three years, right? And, uh, you know, if there's lots of issues in terms of interoperability, then it's gonna be longer. So my call to action for all of us in the industry is that we should work together on that standardization, that interoperability, and kind of feed off of each other to drive that innovation cycle. Javier, you're, you're, you're nodding there, and you know, we, we, we know the work that you do with, with NFE in particular. I mean, it's this working together to, to drive the standardization, because standardization does remain crucially important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean. I think that each, uh, each tool is for, for different purposes. Um, I mean, in, in the case of radio technologies, I, I have no doubt. I mean, the, the, the having predictable standards, particularly in something that is that yet uh, that uh, uh, intensive of uh, specific pieces of hardware, creates uh, a degree of uh, uh, a degree of stability in the industry that, that is crucial right now. I mean, the, deploying a radio that is pretty standard is a high risk. And unless you have big uh, incentives for doing that, it's better to, 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 be, to be less brave. But on the contrary, there are fields where having an unstable framework it will suffice, and then you might go to other agile ways of, uh, of evolving. And particularly in, in the core, we, we are seeing that, uh, that uh, having references in, in open source helps a lot. So uh, you, you need to, to find the, the right tool for, for the job. And, and Coming back to, to the, the path for evolution, I see that the, the, the evolution will not happen in, in this case uh, overnight. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll be exploring, hopefully, different type of uh, uh, radio technologies that gradually will bring us to 5G when, when it's, it's ready and, and frozen. And at the same time, it, it we'll see in, in the core, and we're seeing that, that uh, the way of creating that um, co synchro coordination with the ecosystem follows different, different paths and different rules. And, 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 and we are exploring both, both parts at the same time because we, we understand that that is the way to go. Uh, you, you need to create that uh, sort of con consensus, that sort of momentum gradually, and you need to uh, allow the industry to buy as well the pace at which you are doing the things. 